The world isn't simple anymore. And on the Walden Pond podcast, your host, anti-fraud expert Vince Walden, is talking to experts about the technology and compliance trends you need to know about to keep your compliance and fraud detection programs relevant. If you're looking for insights that are practical, timely, and innovative, welcome to The Pond. Well, welcome to The Pond. I'm your host, Vincent Walden, coming to you on the Compliance Podcast Network. Today, it's an honor to introduce the Honorable Sergio Moro. He is former Minister of Justice and Public Security of Brazil, who's here to talk about the current business landscape in Brazil and, and what's going on. So welcome, Sergio. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here, Vincent. Thank you, and I'm well, glad to have you on the show. And uh, before we begin, I'd like to start off with, a course, a quote from Henry David Thoreau that I think is fitting given uh, your public service in Brazil. And I think you'll appreciate this. He said 150 years ago, justice is sweet and musical, but injustice is harsh and discordant. So <laughs> I think uh, given all the cases that you've tried, I think you could say that justice could be sweet and musical. Oh, great quote. Yeah. I think I'll, I'll borrow it for some lectures or presentations. Right. That'd make a good LinkedIn post. <laughs> Justice is sweet and musical. Well, before we begin, I always like to give the audience a little bit of background of my guests. And uh, yours is particularly interesting and fascinating. So could you give us a little bit of background about your career and how you became Brazil's Minister of Justice and maybe even comment on some of the more interesting cases you presided over. Yes, of course. Well, I worked as a federal judge in Brazil for about uh, 22 years. In Brazil, you uh, became a judge doing public tests. So it's not uncommon to have a federal judge very young. That was my case in the past, not anymore. I worked with several cases involving especially money laundering, because the Brazilian Federal Council made a decision in the beginning of the 2000 years to specialize some courts in this kind of crime. So I started to work with financial crimes, money laundering, drug trafficking, but only if related with money laundering and also bribery cases. I had a, a giant bribery case it's well known. It's called the Operation Carwash or Operação Lava Jato in Portuguese. Right. It was about uh, bribes being paid for public officials in Brazil, in other countries of the world, and usually related to money laundering. This case involved very high politicians in Brazil and in other countries and powerful companies from Brazil and abroad. We used to say that it was a kind of game changer for Latin America, at least when you uh, speak about uh, impunity of grand corruption. Uh, it definitely changed the scenario because these cases in the past usually never go to trial. And right. uh, then we start to have criminals being convicted and serving prison terms. I was invited in the end of 2018 to become the Minister of Justice and Public Security in Brazil. It was hard to refuse this opportunity to consolidate these advances in corruption. So I joined the government, but after growing disagreements with the president, I resigned in April 22. And now I'm dedicated to work at the private sector. Yeah. No, I think who who hasn't heard of uh, the project, the car wash or Lava Jato, as you said, uh, that was a landmark case and your service there was uh, definitely notable. So uh, that's pretty awesome. Well, you know, and I think you said it was a game changer. And let's talk about the current business landscape in Brazil from a risk perspective. You know, when I think about the audience here who are chief compliance officers or members of general counsel, and they think about the risk areas or hot topics going into 2021 and all the things around COVID, post-COVID, getting back to work, anti-corruption, et cetera. What are you seeing are some of the hot topics in Brazil right now? 
let me go a little back to the past to explain the actual situation. Sure. We have the, in Brazil the Clean Companies Act in 2013. It was based on the FCPA. Then mm -hmm. we have the car wash operation. This completely changed the behavior of companies related to wrongdoings, fraud, or corruption policy, anti-corruption policies. Before, uh, they made a research in, I believe it's 2015, a significant number of Brazilian companies, and they have only about 50% of these big companies with compliance systems. In 2017, especially because of the car wash operation, the number had increased to 76%. And in 2019, only 4% of the Brazilian's companies, the large ones, it was not a complete research, did not have a compliance system. So the behavior of Brazilian companies changed. At the past, when issues arise, the normal behavior was to deny everything and never cooperate. <laughs> wow. Today, it's completely different. So we saw during the car wash operation, this change of behavior. And nowadays, despite of some setbacks, maybe at the political field against anti-corruption policies, I'm seeing the Brazilian companies continuing to invest in compliance systems and with the concern that they need to be effective. And also, now they have, uh, at least the, big, the large ones, they have an eye also on uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction. So wow. uh, there are some companies that are worried to do the right thing, not only because it's the right thing, but they don't want, for example, to violate the FCPA Institute. There is a lot of investments on this area in Brazil, and I don't believe this will change. It's a, a definitive tr trend. What I would yes. say, maybe today, today the, the Brazilian companies are very worried to have effective compliance systems for themselves, but also to spread some kind of compliance system to their chain of suppliers. Because third parts were used a lot in the past to channel bribes to public officials. So that's right. one point of concern, for example. Wow. When you said 50% had compliance or investigative programs in place, and now it's jumped to nine, it's around 96, that truly is a game changer. That's impressive. And, and that's only happened over the last maybe five or six years. So I'll say congratulations. I know it's not just you. It's a lot of people working hard in Brazil, particularly the government companies are paying attention, but that's an impressive statistic. And think about the bribes and the corruption avoided as a result of companies being more aggressive in their programs. I'm just curious. So from a U.S. perspective, a lot of the audience on the Walden Pond are compliance professionals in the U.S., but many of them have business operations in Brazil. And what advice or guidance could they do to help best support their local Brazilian colleagues, teams in terms of resources or technologies? What guidance would you have for them to help make ensure that, that operations in Brazil are, are run effectively? Well, there, there are a lot of concerns nowadays about foreign investors, how you, you use your money, how you make investments, for example, in Brazil. Right. There is a lot of talk all around the world, but also in Brazil about ESG and I think that uh, integrity and anti-corruption policies are at the core, at least about the, the government uh, governance issue. I would say that it's worth to work together. For example, U.S. companies who have investments in Brazil or have business operations in Brazil try to mix the local practice in Brazil with the knowledge they have here in the United States, because it's, it's also about having effective compliance systems. We had some large Brazilian companies that were involved in the car wash operation. Some of them paid bribes for several years for public officials, 
And some of them, they, they have compliance systems. Uh, oh. They use it also as a kind of defense. But if you look at the details, it was a kind of fake it, fake it. Compliance right. system. It did not work. So it's necessary to invest in a ineffective in effective compliance systems and maybe mixing best practice of Brazil and United States, this could give important inputs uh, for do that. Yeah, you know, you mentioned something so important. It's not enough just to have policies and procedures written down. They actually have to be implemented in, I like this word, you know, operationalized in terms of actively <laughs> put in place, not just written down. And, Sounds like that's what happened in the past and, and that's indeed changing. You know, and I think about, just let me shift gears a little bit and let's talk about your new role here at our firm, Alvarez and Marsal. First, I'd love to give the audience, and I think a lot of people want to know, what convinced you to join a and given I think you had many options and after your government service? And then what are some of your goals and objectives for this year and how do you want to help companies in Brazil improve their programs? Well, I, I, I work as a judge for 22 years. When I resigned to become a Minister of Justice, it was, a, it was a very difficult decision, but I thought at the moment that I could contribute more for my country being a high level position in Brasilia. Of course, the main goal was anti-corruption policies, but uh, there are a lot of other issues that uh, Minister of Justice had to deal. So uh, when I resigned this position, it was a very hard decision also. But uh, unfortunately, I could not return to the to judiciary. Uh, mm. sign, it, there is no turning back. So uh, I thought about, wow, well, uh, what I can do, what I can do now? Uh, uh, I want to continue to contribute with things that I believe, for example, in, in, in compliance, in integrity, in anti, anti-corruption policies. Well, I need to work uh, at the private sector. And I really believe that the, the, the private sector could make a, a strong difference. Even when the, the government's not paying a lot of attention on anti-corruption, the private sector could take an independent role in doing what is the right. right. And I yeah. also believe that we have now a, a anti-corruption international trend. It's good for the business. Probably the main, main reason is that companies are realizing that it's the best option, not only to avoid problems, but to have good business. Well, yeah. I received some invitations after I... I left the government. I need to wait for a quarantine time of six months. Right. And I already know Alvarez Marçal. I study more about quality of its service. And what attracted me more was the opportunity to work in a global field, having contacts with its partners and employees with high quality but also not only working in Brazil. Of course, it would not be any problem to work in Brazil, but I believe that you need to address these anti-corruption policies in a more global perspective, because it's a global, global problem. Right. So uh, I saw it as an, an opportunity, not also to grow professional, but also to interact with team of expertise in a field that I really believe is important to, to companies, but also in general to the good government. Yeah, and I, I, we're excited to have you and here, you know, bringing your perspectives and experiences to our clients globally, and, and of course in Brazil as well, but it's unprecedented and we're, we're super glad to have you. So we're excited about 2021 and the future ahead. Now, we have time for one last question, and I always kind of like to pose it as what advice would you give just all you know, compliance officers, general counsel, external counsel, as they prioritize kind of their goals and objectives for this year? 
what should they be focused on over the next six months or for the remainder of the year? Well, everyone today are, is worried about uh, the COVID, the COVID pandemic. We are getting over it with the spread of vaccination. Of course, this is not happening at the same pace everywhere. Probably a lot of issues will appear about healthcare expenditure. We had some cases, we saw some cases in Brazil involving overpricing and related with bribery of supplies uh, purchased to, to fight the pandemic. It will be a challenge to see how we will return to work if the home office will continue to be priority on the companies or if we will return to the old habits. Probably we will need to invest more in technology that allows us to work at distance, not only doing meetings, but also to, for example, get the records necessary for the evaluation of a compliance system or to make an internal investigation, internal corporate investigation. There will be a lot of challenges, I believe, in this return from the pandemic and the compliance officers and the general council members need to be, need to pay attention on that. We need to return and well, we cannot relax. We need to advance in this practice of compliance, due diligence and corporate investigations. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. Sergio, I appreciate, thank you so much for uh, spending your, your morning out here with me on the pond. And we look forward to, uh, well, I look forward to working with you as a colleague in the firm, but more importantly, taking your experience and perspectives out to our clients in the marketplace. So thank you for your time. And we'll have, let's get you back on the show in the next couple months and with some updates. So again, thank you for joining. Uh, it will be a pleasure to, to, to speak again. And thank you very much again. Let's have some work together. It will be not ordinary times after yeah. this COVID pandemic. Yeah, no doubt. So, uh, and everybody, thank you for listening to uh, the Walden Pond on Compliance, part of the Compliance Podcast Network, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Walden Pond Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode and help spread the word by leaving a review.